Thank you. Hi, my name is Tom. I'm a software engineer at Wix, and today I'm here to talk to you about two topics that I really, really love, software engineering and philosophy. And we're going to explore the relationship between them. But before diving into software engineering and philosophy, I think I should address a question that's probably on a lot of people's minds just by reading the title of this talk. Software engineering and philosophy? How could these two fields ever be related? I mean, software engineering is from Mars and philosophy is from Venus or something like that, right? They're two completely different things. Now, why is it that this relationship seems so strange to us from the get-go? I think the answer is quite simple. Most of us grew up in Western cultures, and in modern Western culture, it is very common to dichotomize science from humanities and to treat them as if they are mutually exclusive. Let's do a small poll. By a show of hands, please raise your hand if you consider yourself scientific, an analytical thinker, a problem solver. Okay, quite a lot of hands up. You can put your hands down. Now, please raise your hand if you consider yourself artistic, expressive. Significantly less amount of hands are up. Thank you. Please raise your hand if you raised your hand in both, to both questions. Quite a few hands. Nice. Okay, so chances are that no matter what you answer to this question, it probably didn't take you a very long time to figure out what your answer is, because chances are that you've likely been asked this question before in your lifetime in one form or another. I know that I have been asked this question many times in many forms throughout my lifetime, and to be honest, I always kind of struggled with it. I mean, on the one hand, I always loved riddles and math, and I'm into chess, and I'm a software engineer, so I guess that puts me on the science side of the spectrum. But on the other hand, I always loved poetry, and I always loved music, and people, I studied philosophy and psychology, so I guess that puts me on the other side of the spectrum. So what am I really? This was like a deep, a deep question that I felt like society was always forcing me to answer in a way. Well, the truth is that in modern Western culture, this division is very built into our culture. We see it all around us. We see it in our language, in our social structures, in our education system. And it actually doesn't even stop there. We see this also in common pop culture myths or theories that we have lying around, such as one you're probably all familiar with, the left side, right side myth. This theory basically says the following. Our brain is built out of two hemispheres, the left and the right. And it says something which sounds like it makes perfect sense. It says that we're all of us born with a certain tendency towards either the left or right side of the brain, quite similar to how we're born right-handed or left-handed. People who are left-brained, says the theory, are very strong with language, with analytical uh, skills, engineers. People who are right-brained are more artistic, creative, expressive, emotional. Advancement in brain imaging technology and in science has allowed us to actually take this theory and test it. And guess what? It's completely wrong. The brain does not function like this at all. In fact, our brain is all built around interconnections between both hemispheres of the brain. It's been completely disproved that people are born with a disposition towards the left or right side of their brain. The left side of the brain does not have a monopoly on language, and the right side of the brain does not have a monopoly on creativity. It's all in the interconnections. It was also disproved that we are born with a tendency or strength in one or the other, because, in fact, as, it's, as it seems, most of us use both hemispheres quite equally throughout our lifetime. Now, this begs an interesting question. I mean, if science has disproved these theories, how come they're still around us? I just saw one on my Twitter feed a week ago asking, do you see something green or purple here? If you see something green, then you are clearly left-brained, and if it's purple, then you're clearly right-brained. But this is complete BS. The reason it's still around us is because as humans, we're very apt towards binary thinking. It's very convenient for us to think about things that either either right or wrong, good or bad, beautiful or ugly. Now, there's also a good reason for this. Binary thinking is very cost-effective. 
My brain can decide very quickly and with very little information, what is this thing? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it beautiful? Is it ugly? But it also comes binary thinking with a very large cost. And the cost is that we distort reality. We don't see reality for what it is. One person that identified this division between science and humanities very well is Seymour Papert. In 1980, he wrote a wonderful book named Mindstorms, in which he explores the relationship between math and science and humanities. Papert called this division between the science and humanities the great divide of our generation. Now, this was 40 years ago, but I think it remains true to this day. Papert was very intrigued by children. He noticed that a lot of kids really, really, really hate math or are afraid of math. And he believed that it was not due to math itself or to the nature of math, it was just due to the way that math was being taught. So he created this programming language named Logo. How many people here have ever heard of Logo? Wow, a lot of people, great. So Logo is something really cool for those of you who never heard of it, so it was a new way of teaching math. So in Logo, you would have this robot turtle with a pen connected to its belly, and the kids would write imperative code to move the turtle around. So you would have commands like, move 30 degrees to the right, move 50 degrees to the left, go straight, go back. The kids would write code, and they would watch the turtle move around, and that way they would learn about angles, geometry, math, a really, really, really cool way of learning math. It was extremely effective as well. Papert believed that the computer may serve as the force to break down the line between these two cultures, between the culture of the scientific and that of the humanistic. The aim of this talk is to continue in Papert's footsteps in breaking this line. So let's start diving in a bit. So we're going to talk about development and we're going to talk about philosophy. So let's start with a development, a developer. Who is the developer? What is the development process? Well, the development process always starts from an external requirement. It can come from a product manager, it can come from the developer themselves, but there is a requirement to do something in the world. Let's say a product manager comes up to you and they want to build the next Twitter. Cool. Your role is to get this thing into production. The million dollar question is, where do you start? So say that we are building Twitter, I don't know, do you start with picking the front-end framework? Maybe you start with the back end. Maybe you think about data databases. Maybe you think about the cloud provider because you want to scale. The truth is that none of these answers are really, really a good starting point. Rich Hickey has a wonderful lecture titled Hammock Driven Development. If you didn't watch it, I highly recommend that you do. And in this talk, he basically suggests that the first thing you should do when you face any problem is get up from the computer go lie in a hammock and think. And that's some really, really, really sound advice, even if it sounds like hippie in a way. Uh, the truth is that no matter what way you go about it, whether you go lie in a hammock, you go walk on the beach, you talk to a friend, the first thing you should start by doing is what we call software design. Software design is the process in which we basically think about the problem that we're aiming to solve, we create abstractions to represent it, and we hopefully devise a plan that will allow us to actually solve the problem that we're out to solve. So the aim is to solve a problem, and any software design should basically answer a few very fundamental questions. Questions like, what entities exist in your system? What are their properties? What do they do? What is the relationship between them? And what is the correct way to use them? That's software design. That's how we usually start. Now let's talk a bit about the philosophical process. So maybe it's worth starting by asking, who is the philosopher really? And I think maybe the best prototype for a philosopher, I now see this very well, I, just, I have a daughter that is three years old, and I feel that I have a philosopher now in my house. Because in fact, all kids are philosophers. Because I look at her walking around the world, and basically what she's trying to do is she's trying to understand. She's trying to understand what is around us. 
Bertrand Russell is a British philosopher. He said that the fundamental question that any philosophy should answer is what are the world's furniture? So what exists out here? So how do they do that? This field of very fundamental questions is what is called metaphysics, and it, it, it revolves around questions such as what exists? What is the property of those things that exist? What do they do? What is the relationship between them? What is the right way to talk about them? And how did they even come to be? All really great questions. So we already see some similarities between the design process and the metaphysical process in the fact that we ask pretty similar questions. But there are also some key differences. So the philosopher, or my daughter in this case, their scope, the scope of their inquiry is defined by the world. So she lives on planet Earth in a certain city, and she needs to explore this world. For the developers, the scope is defined by the product. So if we're building Twitter, we're not going to expect to have any chess pieces lying around, for example, in our application. Now, another very important difference is that while the philosopher asks questions about the world, they want to explain this world around us, the developer gets an amazing superpower. They also get to decide what this world is, which is why I actually like to look at this part of software engineering in a way like doing metaphysics, but with the superpower of creation. So the developer gets not only to ask, but to decide what the world is going to be. Both of them need to provide answers, and the answers need to be coherent, logical. They need to work and make sense. Not just any answer is good enough. So we see this similarity in, in the questions that we ask. The next natural question is, do we answer them in the same way? Now let's take a look at a very ancient philosophical problem and try to think about that from that perspective. So that problem is called the problem of universals. It's a thousands of years old. Now, this bottle that I hold in my hand right now is what metaphysicians would call a particular. It exhibits certain qualities. It is round, it's in my hand, it's almost completely full, it's pink. Now, I can imagine a bottle that lacks some of these qualities, a bottle that is a different shape, a different color, that is not in my hand right now, but I would still consider it a bottle. Now, this bottleness that I say that the two bottles share, this is the universal. What is that thing, really? That is the problem of universals. The way that we talk about universals in our everyday life is as if particulars share them, right? So we say, for example, that all of these are the same color, and all of these are sandwiches, and all of these are chairs. What is this thing that those things share? The universals have particular interesting qualities. For example, we said about this bottle that we can imagine different bottles, but try the following thought experiment. Can you think about a bottle that has no qualities at all? No length, no color, no size. So, what is this bottle? We can't really think about it, we can't really hold it in our mind, we can't draw it, because obviously if we drew it, then it would have certain properties. One answer to this is Plato's. Plato believed that things like sandwichness, redness, humanness, basically all of the universals, he believed that they very deeply exist. In fact, he believed that they are the only thing that truly exists. They are perfect, they are eternal, they are never changing. Everything that we see in the world around us, the particulars, are just mere reflections of these ideas. So, basically, this sandwich that I see exists because there is sandwichness. Now, while this sandwich has certain properties of particulars, for example, I can eat it, I can throw it out, I can add some mayonnaise to it. Sandwichness in itself is whole, it's perfect, it's never changing. I can't add mayonnaise to that. So Plato's theories of ideas can be summed up to the following eight points. I'll go over them quickly. So there exist ideas and things, like we said. Ideas are eternal. Things can be created and destroyed, like the sandwich. 
Things depend on ideas. They actually exist because of ideas. Ideas are the models of things. One idea can correspond to many things. Plato also believed that the ideas form a hierarchy between them and that there is exactly one idea which is at the top of the hierarchy. According to Plato, by the way, that idea was goodness. He believed he was a very big optimist and he believed that everything in this world comes out from goodness, basically. So that's Plato. Now let's skip about 1900 years into the realm of object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming is around the idea of objects that exhibit certain qualities. In the class-based version, objects are instantiated from classes. So classes are models for objects. In many languages, classes are compile time structures, meaning they are eternal. And also you cannot hold in your hand, like in your software, you cannot point to something at runtime and say, this is the class, because it doesn't exist. It's just a concept. Objects, that are, on the other hand, are runtime structures. They can be created, destroyed, modified, they change. Are you seeing the similarities yet? If you're not completely convinced, here's a reminder. This is Plato's ideas. And just watch what happens when you replace the word idea with class and thing with object. And here's what comes out. So there exist classes and objects. Classes are eternal, compile time structures. Objects can be created and destroyed, runtime structures. Objects depend on classes, of course. Classes are models for objects. One class corresponds to many objects. The classes form a hierarchy, and there is exactly one class which is at the top of the hierarchy. Now, this should also probably ring a bell to most of you. If you're familiar with Java, for example, in which the ultimate superclass is, of course, object. Amazing, right? This is Plato's eight points, and I think they actually cover class-based object-oriented programming really, really well. The source to this comparison is a wonderful paper with a brilliant title, Did Plato Foresee Object-Oriented Programming? Now, the author here, nor do I, we don't claim that, uh, uh, that it did necessarily. But I think this really shows that even if it didn't, then it definitely could have. I mean, the similarities are amazing. And this is where the potential lies. OK, so we took a bit of a trip. We started the development process. And we started it by lying in a, lying in a hammock and thinking, basically. We designed. Now on to the next thing. Also a very, very controversial topic. Where do we go next? Do we write code? Do we write tests? I'm not going to go into this whole heated discussion right now. And I'm just going to assume that you're being good and that you're writing tests first. So let's talk about tests for a bit. So this is like a simple test. Every test is basically broken up into four categories, four stages, sorry. There is the setup stage, the exercise stage, and the verify stage. And sometimes there is also a teardown stage. This is a very simple uh, test for a to-do list. Now I want to introduce you first to, uh, for a second to the uh, German philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. So Ludwig Wittgenstein wrote the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, a book that is aimed basically to explain everything there is to explain about the world, everything there is to explain about science, and the boundaries of the world. That was the goal that Wittgenstein had in mind when he wrote this book. By the way, when he finished it, he believed that he did it. We can all go to the beach. Yeah, I know everything there is to know, basically. Now, Wittgenstein was very, very uh, uh, passionate about trying to find an answer, like we said in all philosophy, to explain the world. And he believed that the key to explaining the world was in the relationship between the world, our thought, and our language. More on that in a few minutes. So here I have a few quotes from, from uh, Wittgenstein. We'll go over them quickly, and then we'll see what Wittgenstein would say about testing. So the world is the totality of facts, not of things. The logical picture of the fact is the thought. 
and propositions are truth functions. So I'm going to go over them quickly, just so you have some background. We'll start from the bottom one. I think it's the simplest one. So propositions are truth functions. You can think about them like booleans. They are sentences about the world, which can be true or false. I hold a remote in my hand right now. This is a proposition. If it's true, then it's a fact. If it's false, it's just a false proposition. Those are propositions, simple enough. The logical picture of the facts is the thought. So Wittgenstein is trying to explain to us what a thought is by appealing to the idea of pictures. So what is a picture? Let's think about a physical picture. A physical picture is just an organization of entities in physical space. Wittgenstein thinks about the thought in a similar way. Thought is like an organization of entities in logical space. That is the thought. He then goes on to say that the world is the totality of facts, not of things. So if we go back to Bernard Russell that I've mentioned before, he talked about the world's furniture. Wittgenstein says, hey, knowing what exists in the world, knowing the things, is not enough. You don't really know anything of value when you know that. But when you have facts, when you can express propositions about these things and they check out, such as this remote is in my hand right now, that's when you have something useful. That's when you have a fact. Wittgenstein believed that the world is the totality of facts. So in theory, if I could hold all of the facts that there are to know about this world, I could say that I know everything that there is to know about the world. Of course, that's not really possible. So going back to the test, let's see how Wittgenstein would say that. Well, a test is a lot like a picture. In the setup phase, you sort of set up the stage for your picture. In the exercise stage, you organize them. You organize the entities around in the logical space in this case. You then express a proposition, something that can be true or false. And if this proposition checks out, I really do hold this remote in my hand right now, then I can say that I have a fact. Now, I think there is a very important insight lying around here. So we see here how tests express facts. And Wittgenstein also tells us that the world is the sum of all facts. So if I take this to the software world and each test is a fact, let's say that I could test everything there is to test in my software. I could say that I really know everything there is to know about my software, dream. Of course, due to the nature of programming, this is not possible. You cannot test every possible state permutation of your application. You just cannot. So when combining the two, what are we left with? All I know are facts, so I have to have tests, but I can't test everything. And here comes the big burden of responsibility on all of us. That means the tests are very important, but that we need to choose what tests we need to write. Now, there's also a bunch of advice around that. Like, a common advice is to follow the, the so-called code path and to check code coverage. If you covered every line of code, then you covered everything. Of course, Wittgenstein teaches us that that is not true. That is not the important or interesting fact that there is to know about my software, that if every line of code runs, everything still works. The important things are the various use cases that my users will need to actually perform. So we're actually left here with this very important question that we all need to ask ourselves, which is, what are the important facts in our applications? What do we need to test in order to be sure that our software really behaves the way that we want it to behave? So those are tests, and that's why they're so important. So zooming out again. So we want to build this Twitter agent. We, uh, go, we went to lie in a hammock for a bit. We wrote some tests, which is basically expressing pictures and propositions. Now it's finally time to start writing some code. Code, I will point out, is always written in a certain programming language. I think we don't give it enough thought sometimes, but actually the coder's job is a lot like any other writer. I mean, think about it. The starting point is exactly the same. You sit in front of a computer, a text editor, or an IDE. You have a blinking cursor that is staring at you, 
and you need to use your language to express hopefully meaningful things in order to do something. Now we know, we all know in the software industry that, software, that programming languages are very important and that they have a lot of effect. In fact, in the Pragmatic Programmer, tip number eight says that you should learn at least one new language every year, as different languages solve the same problem in different ways. So by learning different approaches, you can help broaden your thinking. Wittgenstein takes this idea even one step further, and he says that the limits of my language are the limit of my world. If you don't believe him, another nice thought experimentation that you can try now is you can try to think about something that you cannot express in words. Try it out now for a second. Now, if you succeeded in thinking about something that you cannot express in words, please come to me in the break and tell me about it, using your words, of course. During my research for this talk, I was lucky enough to stumble upon the work of Harrison Ainsworth. Now, he also, he read Wittgenstein, and he's also a software engineer, and he really loved the idea of bringing Wittgenstein to engineering, so he wrote a full translation of the whole Tractatus into the software engineering domain. A really interesting work. He says, the limits of our programming languages mean the limit of our imagination. So it's not only the limit of what I can experience, it's the limit of what I can even think about or dream about. It's all defined by the language. Now, this applies to programming languages, but when you think about it, any language, English, Hungarian, behaves just the same. A programming language is just one case of a language. So, going back to this triangle of the world, the language, and the thought, we said the goal is to explain the world. So, Wittgenstein and Ainsworth show us that this world is limited by our language. And Ainsworth also says that, in general, we are limited by our language, we are limited in even what we can think. So we can see this triangle really working well. I think the important insight here for us is to always remember that we are working within certain boundaries. And that's why the advice from the pragmatic programmer is also so powerful. Sometimes learning a new programming language can help you not only to solve the same problem in different ways, but to discover problems that you didn't even know existed, or to find solutions that you never could have thought of since you just didn't have the vocabulary in a different language. Wittgenstein ends the Tractatus with this wonderful sentence, and he said, what can be said at all can be said clearly. And whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Ainsworth adapted this to software engineering, and he says this, what can be designed at all can be designed precisely. What is unknown, we must leave uncoded. Now, this is some very, very good and powerful advice, advice that personally I really, really wish that I knew to listen to that well, more than, more than I do, even at the moment, even knowing this. Remember, we talked about the limitations of language and thought and everything. How many times did you ever optimize for a scenario that never ended up happening? How many times did you write a piece of code that was good enough to solve the problem that you're currently trying to solve, but you spent hours, days, maybe weeks, just because something didn't feel right. Maybe you could do it better. Maybe we'd have that kind of consumer who would need to use it in a different way. It's not generic enough. All those kinds of things. I know that personally in my career, I spent a lot of time on that. But no, what Wittgenstein and Ainsworth tell us is that, hey, dude, this is outside the boundary. Everything that is unknown we must leave uncoded. We don't need to waste more time about it now. Let's just solve the problems that we have right now, and in the future, when we get these new problems, then we'll solve them. I think it's something, it's a trap that a lot of us fall to in our everyday life, and this really sound advice can help us avoid it. So let's summarize a bit what we saw here. So, 
we sort of looked at the development process in a new different way, and we looked at it like a philosophical development process. I actually claim, and I hope that you've seen here today, that you in your everyday jobs as software engineers actually engage in philosophical activity in your everyday life, whether you realize it or not. So we started by lining in a hammock and doing design, which is sort of like doing metaphysics, just with this wonderful superpower of creation. We then wrote tests, which are mainly about expressing pictures and propositions and then gaining facts about our software. And then we wrote code, which is solving our problems by expressing ourselves in a given programming language, which defines our limitations. So I hope that I've convinced you today that software engineering and philosophy are not mutually exclusive. And in fact, they are a lot more related and interconnected than you probably thought before. We also saw today how software is limited, right? Everything that there is to know are the facts, but I can't know all of the facts, so I need to choose. This is the big burden of choice. I also hope that you saw how philosophy can inspire new ideas in software. Now, I really, really believe that, and I think Plato's eight points compared to class-based object-oriented programming really shows that well. So ideas can come from very unexpected places sometimes. And in fact, philosophy can be a great source of inspiration to ideas in computer science. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. All right, wonderful. We even have some time for questions. So, what programming language combinations do you think maximize our vocabulary and imaginations? So I don't really know if there is like a specific combination that would maximize it. Uh, I recently started learning ReasonML, like in the last year I've been learning it, and I feel like just learning it has really changed the way that I see problems around me and the way that I approach problems. Uh, so I think just learning new things is, is the key here. And basically staying, like I talked about my daughter, staying curious, continuing to ask questions and to question the boundaries. This is how you develop most, I think. All right. The, you can ask one question to the future you. What would that be? Ooh. I don't know. <laughs> it's a very deep question. What a meta question. Next one. The parallel with Plato is such a neat proof of the world being a simulation. Did you notice that? Not sure what that means, but that sounds like an interesting talk. I'd love to hear more. I feel like that's a continuation of yesterday's conspiracy theories about flat Earth society <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, it's like a Truman Show kind of a thing. Yeah. Possible. All right. What parallel do you draw to testing or otherwise from Proposition 7 of the track software development? Track test to stow. Oh, God. What one cannot talk about, one must pass over in silence. Undefined behaviors? No, so I think what, what I get from this sentence of what can, you cannot talk about, you must remain silent about, is that there are boundaries and that you always need to make a choice. And anything that you choose to test, for example, is something that you chose not to test or anything that you chose to implement comes at the expense of something else. And that's why the core here is just understanding this nature of things, that some things go inside the boundary and some things are outside. And then you just need to choose. So, for example, if this experience is very important to my, to my users, this is something that I need to test. If not, then probably not. All right. Thank you. What philosophy books do you recommend for an average programmer? OK, so I think a really good intro to philosophy for people who just want to start getting, like, basically a summary of everything that's been going on for the last few thousand years and the main problems is a, a book called The Problems of Philosophy by Bernard Russell. It's a really good uh, intro. Uh, I actually personally started from reading uh, Nietzsche. Uh, which who I really, really love. But I think it's like uh, uh, Bernard Russell is probably a good starting point to get an overview of things. But I would say that in general, you should not feel too intimidated 
to pick up a, a, any, any philosophy book and to start reading it. Um, it's basically really the source is curious people asking questions about the world. If you're software engineers, you probably already have all of the skills that you need in order to understand everything that they're talking about. And it's a really fascinating discussion that's been going on for thousands of years, basically. Maybe you can still recommend a couple of books on your Twitter account, and then people can just yeah, check it out sure. to start with. Sure. Um, what do you think of the saying that everything that is made was already made, and there is nothing new under the sun? I think it's a beautiful saying. <laughs> uh, Plato actually has something very uh, nice called the uh, remembrance theory. He basically believed that when kids are born, you're basically born with all of the knowledge that exists. You are born with everything. And then what happens in your life is that you just forget. And basically learning something new, when you're learning something, you're just remembering something that you knew before. That, that Plato has this kind of uh, uh, theory, which is actually the base of, I guess, something like that. Um, I don't know. I don't know, I guess, because I think it's also a very deep truth, for example, that everything changes all the time. So I think it's sort of the combination of both. Everything changes all the time, and nothing changes at all. <laughs> Somehow, these two things live together to make our crazy world. Mind-blowing. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, do you learn a new language a year? Personally, I don't. I think it's a really good advice, but it's very, uh, like, you need to have a lot of time and discipline to do that. Uh, I do try to keep my, eyes, my ears open. Uh, I, I watch a lot of lectures. I hear a lot of talks. I'm very interested in, like, uh, uh, languages and uh, manifestos that come out sometimes, like things that explain the main design principles or stuff just to understand the approach of the language, but I don't personally do this really every year. All right. Maybe last question. Design needs to be good enough. Does that already mean precisely designed? Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, I think that's also, there's also a tension here, and, and this is exactly the area in which we engineers sometimes struggle, because good enough is great, okay? Good enough is it solves the problem that you're trying to solve. This, is, this was your goal. You're done. Everything is great. Uh, but also, remember, like Ainsworth said, that everything that can be designed at all can be designed precisely. And as engineers, we try to find the best solutions to everything. So I think there is sort of like a tension between, OK, if I solve the problem, is it good enough? The answer is most likely yes. But when trying to solve this problem, I should try to think about, OK, what is the best way to solve it? That, that, that should al always be on our minds. All right. Thank you very much. I think you answered really a lot of questions. Thank you for that. Thank you.